It's two years since Lebanon's greatest disaster, and once again, the port is burning. The fire has been burning for close to a month now, and the city is awash with the smell of acrid smoke. The sound of helicopters ferrying water to and fro puncture the normal sounds of the city. The fire is burning as crowds gather and victims speak to commemorate the two-year anniversary of the August 4th port blast. It's with some irony, morbid, poetic, call it what you will, that the port grain silos which shielded so many from destruction on that day became the most recent victims on its second anniversary. On August 4th, 2020, Beirut's port exploded, killing at least 231 and wounding over 7,000. My name is Will Christou. Welcome to the New Arab Voice. The story of Beirut's port blast starts seven years prior to that deadly day. In October 2013, the MV Rosas, a ship owned by a dormant London-registered company called Savaro Limited, arrived at the main port in Beirut. In its cargo hold was 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate, which was unloaded and put into storage at the port. Commonly used in fertilizers, pyrotechnics, herbicides, and insecticides, and in the manufacturing of nitrous oxide, this shipment of ammonium nitrate had been sent from Georgia, and was reportedly intended to be sent to an explosives factory in Mozambique. Upon arrival, the MV Rosas was detained at the port over unpaid debts and technical defects related to the ship itself. These defects were self-evident when, in 2018, the ship sank at its moorings. Those 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate would sit at the Beirut port for seven years, forgotten, ignored, unsecured, and highly volatile. For us, it was, you know, a relatively ordinary day. This is Sarah Copland. In 2020, Sarah was working for the UN in Beirut, focusing on women's empowerment and gender equality in the Arab region. I had been working at home ever since the start of COVID, even though a lot of my colleagues had gone back to the office, but I was pregnant with our second son at the time, and so I was continuing to work from home due to the pandemic. Sarah lived in an apartment in the Eshrafia neighborhood of Beirut with her husband Craig and her two-year-old son Isaac, less than a kilometer from the port. It was a really hot summer day, which I'm sure many people can remember. Isaac had spent the morning at his daycare, which he loved. He loved it there. He was learning French and Arabic. So he'd spent the morning morning there, and I'd been working from home, and my husband was, you know, doing his thing. I mean, it was just so ordinary for us. It was um, We had uh, a set routine for Isaac's dinner and bath and bedtime, and so he was having dinner at his usual time, sitting in his high chair. I was sitting with him while he was eating. My husband had stepped out of the room. Just a few hundred meters away at around 5.45 p.m. on August 4th, 2020, a fire started in Warehouse 12 at the port. It's still not been determined what started the fire. Some have said that welding work sparked the blaze, while others suspected that perhaps an errant cigarette was the cause. Whatever the initial spark, Warehouse 12 was a tinderbox waiting to ignite. Inside was 23 tons of fireworks, tires, methanol, ignition fuses, oils, furniture, wood, foodstuffs, and of course, thousands of tons of ammonium nitrate. At 5.55 p.m., the fire brigade was called to come tackle the blaze. They were not told about the mountain of explosives inside. The crew of nine firefighters and one paramedic rushed to the scene. Photos taken at the time show two of the firefighters and a civilian attempting to pry open the door to Warehouse 12 with a crowbar. On the door was a sign indicating the presence of hazardous chemicals. At 6.07 p.m., there was an explosion. A bang is heard across the local area. And then I heard sort of a loud bang, and I walked up to our balcony. So we had glass doors leading out onto a balcony to see if I could see anything. And while we were only 750 metres, 800 metres away from the port, we couldn't actually see it from our apartment. There were other buildings in the way. Videos show a plume of white smoke coming from the port. Flashes of light can be seen, believed to be fireworks exploding. And just in that time that I sort of walked back to, to Isaac, the, the second massive explosion. Oh my God. <laughs> 34 seconds after the first explosion, Beirut was ripped apart. A massive shockwave erupted from the port, and a split second later, a deafening boom. Buildings in its path are torn apart. 
many collapse. The pressure of the shockwave makes doors fly off their hinges and windows explode in a deadly hail of glass. In Cyprus, 240 kilometers away, the window panes rattle. The United States Geological Survey detected the blast and recorded a seismic event of magnitude 3.3. The blast would later be determined to be the sixth largest non-nuclear explosion in human history. So I was thrown to the ground immediately, and Isaac's high chair was kind of thrown across the room. Once I sort of managed to stand up, I ran immediately towards Isaac. My husband, Craig, came running in from the other room. And we didn't know what it was at first, like many people. You know, we didn't know whether it was a terrorist attack or the city was being bombed or or whatnot. So we didn't know what was happening. And so we grabbed Isaac and ran to the bathroom because we didn't know if there would be another explosion. And we thought that it might be safer in the bathroom where there's no windows. On the streets, it was pandemonium. People screamed. Glass, masonry, furniture and debris covered the roads and pavements. The walking wounded stumbled out covered in dust and blood. Those who couldn't walk lay sprawled on the ground. In the bathroom of Sarah and Craig's apartment, something was terribly wrong. But once we got there, we realized he was bleeding quite profusely from his chest. I wrapped him in a towel and and just ran. um, Just ran with him like I no. Phone, no keys, no wallet, no, no anything. It was um, it, somehow I managed to put on some sh- sh- some shoes. I don't remember how, um, and I just ran. And my husband ran after me because um, we knew we needed to get him help. He was he was too injured. Um, and you know, outside on the street, it just I mean, the people of Beirut know it, it looked like. I mean, the only way to describe it is a war zone. It was um, destruction everywhere. People lying on the street bleeding, um, glass, just glass everywhere. At some point, my husband took Isaac from me and we ran up to the main road to Charles Mallet Street and I just ran out into the middle of the road <laughs> to stop a car. The driver let us in. He was, uh, was a man driving and he had his family in the car, his, his wife and, and two young girls. And he drove us to the hospital, to Rafiq Hariri Hospital. Well, the Rafiq Hariri Hospital was not the closest. What Sarah and Craig didn't know at the time was that their nearest hospital, the St. George Hospital, had suffered extensive damage in the blast. He was driving like the wrong way down the street, 100 k's an hour, um, trying to get us there as fast as possible. And when we arrived, he accidentally drove up to the specialized COVID wing of the hospital. And uh, we were one of the first to arrive at Rafiq Hariri, you know, because a lot of other people were trying to go to St. George or LAU or AUB. And so they tried to turn us away because we were at the COVID, COVID wing, but we insisted on pushing through and a doctor saw us. And, you know, I was, I was also quite injured. I had glass in my face and uh, was bleeding and they saw how injured Isaac was. So they, they sort of ushered us in and then they took Isaac. And because I was injured and, you know, heavily pregnant at the time, they put me in a wheelchair and took me to another part of the hospital to attend to my injuries and to check on the baby. And and that was the last time I saw Isaac. Um, my husband stayed with him, but he, he died shortly afterwards. Isaac would be one of at least 231 people killed in the blast. And aged just two years and three months old, he was also one of the youngest victims. And when I say at least 231 victims, the true toll will never be known, since the government has kept no official death toll. At best, we have estimates. When the port detonated, Human Rights Watch researcher Aya Majzoub was in the Hamra neighborhood of Beirut, in the western part of the city, approximately four kilometers from the blast site. Um, and then suddenly, uh, just after 6 p.m., I heard uh, oh, there was a big tremor. Everything in the house started uh, moving, so I thought it was an earthquake, and I ran to the corridor. And then seconds later, I heard the loudest sound I'd ever heard in my life, followed by the sound of crashing glass. All of the windows in her house were blown out, but Aya was thankfully unhurt. At first, it was unclear to Aya where the blast had come from. She initially suspected that a bomb had detonated at the house of former Prime Minister Saad Hariri. But news quickly spread that something terrible had happened at the port. So I quickly rushed to uh, Marm Khayal, an area right next to the port that was very heavily damaged, and met up with a colleague of mine. 
and we started doing interviews with you know, first responders, with the firefighters, with members of the Lebanese Red Cross, with front care health workers about how they were responding in the aftermath of the blast. Aya and her colleague made their way to a nearby hospital, now partially collapsed by the impact of the blast, where they were met with horrifying scenes. At the time, you know, the COVID pandemic was also raging in the country and the COVID ward had completely collapsed in that hospital. And so doctors and nurses were trying to take patients out of the collapsed COVID ward, keep them separate from other patients who were coming in because of the blast. There was no electricity. At some points, doctors and nurses were having to do surgeries in the parking lot using their mobile phones for lights. I mean, it really was something out of, like, out of a movie. It felt like the zombie apocalypse. 7,000 people were injured in the blast. And Lebanon's heroic doctors and nurses, who, for the past seven months, had battled the spread of COVID-19 amid the collapse of the state, were now faced with challenges akin to a war zone. As night fell across the city, efforts to help the wounded identify the dead and search in the rubble of collapsed buildings for survivors continued. At daybreak, the city stumbled into light, still in shock. And the full scale of the utter devastation lay bare before them. The most badly damaged areas were the port and its immediate surroundings, and the East Beirut neighborhoods of Marmachael and Jemeze. Both of these are very popular areas. Restaurants and bars line the streets, and on a regular evening you can see hundreds of people enjoying the warm summer evening air with a cool drink. Both of these are also dense residential areas. The port blast would leave 300,000 homeless and inflict an estimated $15 billion worth of damage. In the days after that, we saw a complete absence of the state. You know, the security forces, the army, none of them were mobilized in order to lead cleanup efforts and, and reconstruction efforts. And instead, what we saw were young people with brooms and mops just going house to house, making sure that everybody was okay and everybody who needed support was connected with the right NGO to provide them with support. You know, you'd see members of the security forces and the army just loitering on corners, smoking cigarettes and just seeing completely uninterested in all of the reconstruction and rehabilitation efforts. And then at one point, the army did this very bizarre promotional video where they just walked through the ruined streets of Jemeze carrying broomsticks but not actually doing anything. It was just very emblematic emblematic of the state's response. One volunteer, Rana, who was helping those affected in the days after, summed up the mood. We're here, the revolutionaries, taking the place of the state which is supposed to be taking care, cleaning and securing food and water for the people affected. We're taking on its role and we're trying the best we can to help the people. As the cleanup continued, the residents of Beirut and all across Lebanon were beginning to ask questions. How could this happen? And who's responsible? Into this fray of grief and anger stepped French President Emmanuel Macron. He traveled to Beirut on August 6th, just two days after the blast. As he walked down the street, he was mobbed by crowds of people who begged the French president to do something to help them amid a deafening silence from the state. Soon, a familiar word reverberated through the streets, Thawra, Arabic for revolution. Later, Macron went to the presidential palace in Baabda to meet with Lebanese President Michel Aoun. After his meeting, he spoke with reporters. I also hope, and this has started, for investigations to be carried out as quickly as possible in a perfectly independent and transparent framework in order to explain and account for the causes of this explosion, because this is precisely what is owed to all the victims and their families. It wasn't the first time Lebanon had demanded answers from those in power. During the economic crisis that hit the country just a few months earlier, people asked the same questions, for which they received no answer and saw no accountability. In the days immediately following the blast, the government promised that an investigation would be carried out, also adding that it would be completed in just five days. Confidence in the investigation was almost non-existent. Sarah Copland again. You know, when uh, this first happened, I remember saying to my husband, I was like, there is no point pursuing justice because nothing's ever going to happen, nothing's ever going to change. It's not a fight that we want to put our energy into. You know, we need to focus on on our grief and our our newborn son and whatnot. 
and I am a Zoop. You know, very early on, when the you know right after the blast happened, we knew the structural deficiencies in the Lebanese judiciary, and we knew that it was going to be very difficult to achieve justice domestically. And early on that night, it was already becoming clear that very high-level members of the government and security institutions knew about the ammonium nitrate in the port. Um, and so immediately we knew that this was an event that was going to involve very high-level leaders in Lebanon. Investigations concluded after the blast, but not by the Lebanese government, and documents leaked online revealed that the authorities in Lebanon knew about the ammonium nitrate sitting in Warehouse 12. On June 27, 2014, then-director of Lebanese Customs, Shafiq Merhi, wrote to an urgent matters judge highlighting the dangers that the chemicals posed and calling for action to be taken. Between May 20, 2016 and October 27, 2017, three more letters were sent by Lebanese custom officials, again a warning of the dangers. Their warnings were not acknowledged. At the beginning of 2020, a team who inspected the stockpile warned that if the chemicals were not moved, then it would, quote, blow up all of Beirut, according to an anonymous source who spoke to Reuters. Knowledge about the shipment of explosives reportedly went as high as then-Prime Minister Hassan Diab and President Michel Aoun. They knew it was there. They knew the risks. They chose to do nothing. Our faith in the ability of the Lebanese judiciary to hold those high-level individuals to account was not very high given the Lebanese judiciary's track record. Um, and so right after the explosion, we started calling for an independent investigation with the participation of international experts. So we, we hadn't called for an international investigation just yet. Um, but we thought that the presence of international experts could add some credibility and impartiality and some necessary technical experience to any Lebanese investigation. The case was referred to the Judicial Council on August 10th. So the Judicial Council is an exceptional court that gets cases based on referrals from the government. While all very official and impressively high level, the Judicial Council is deeply flawed. It doesn't meet fair trial standards or due process standards. So for example, the judicial investigator or the judge leading the investigation, none of his decisions are subject to appeal. Uh, so there's no independent review of any of the decisions that the judge takes. And the judge, the final judgments of this judicial council are also not subject to any appeal. And this is a violation both to the rights of the defendants as well as the victims and the public. Also, there are no limits on pretrial detention in the judicial council. And so as we've seen now, there are people who have been detained for almost two years uh, without being charged, without any prospect of a trial in the near future. So we consider their detention at this point arbitrary. The majority of those who have been detained in relation to the blast are either middling or low-level employees. And this judicial council in Lebanon is sometimes jokingly referred to as the grave of cases because um, you know, cases get referred to the Judicial Council and then they languish there for years without any resolution. That seems to be happening now. And we are very concerned by the fair trial violations in this Judicial Council. Despite the flaws in the Judicial Council, it did throw one surprise. Judge Fadi Sawan, who was appointed by the Justice Minister as a judicial investigator on August 13th. Perhaps unknown even to the authorities who started the investigation, Judge Sawan was willing to engage in a basic level of competency. High-level ministers were called in for questioning. Judge Sawan summoned the former Minister of Transportation and Public Works, three labor ministers, the General Director of the Lebanese State Security, the Director General of Lebanon's Land and Maritime Transport Division, and the General Director of General Security. And on December 10th, 2020, Sawan charged Lebanon's caretaker Prime Minister Hassan Diab and three former ministers with negligence. He also wrote to Lebanon's Speaker of the Parliament, Nabih Berri, and requested that any immunity for ministers be lifted. It soon became apparent that this was not the type of investigation that Lebanon's ruling elite had hoped for. There was even a simulation of the uh, welding that took place on the day of 4 August, and this was done in order to confirm whether this could be a welding accident or not. This is Rida Frangia, a lawyer, researcher, and member of Legal Agenda. Since the blast, Rida has been closely monitoring the progress of the investigation. The investigation had seen a lot of progress before it was suspended. Yep, suspended. 
Lebanon's powerful ruling elite wanted progress in the investigation. They wanted to see those responsible brought to justice and to pay for their crimes. So long as those people were not them. On February 18th, the Court of Cassation made the decision to remove Judge Sawan from the case. Two former ministers, Ali Hassan Khalil and Ghazi Zaitar, who had both been charged, made complaints against the judge, claiming that he was unable to be impartial because his house was one of the thousands that were damaged in the blast. So, Judge Sawan is removed and replaced by Judge Tariq Bitar. Judge Bitar, a judge from Tripoli with a reputation for sticking to the book, has followed in his predecessor's footsteps. He has summoned former Prime Minister Hassan Diab for questioning, issued warrants for former ministers, and even asked to interrogate one of the most powerful men in the country, Intelligence Chief Abbas Ibrahim. To say he ruffled some feathers is an understatement. Lebanon's political class used every tactic in the playbook to stop his investigation. Over 25 lawsuits were filed by officials seeking to avoid questioning. The government refused to meet until Bitar was removed from his post. And a public smear campaign ensued, claiming Bitar was doing the United States dirty work. However, Bitar's investigation continued, gradually and painfully. Lebanon's factions took a different tactic, calling their supporters to the streets in October 2021 to protest the judge. A bloodbath ensued. Gunmen took to the streets and turned Beirut into a battleground. Seven were left dead, including a mother who was sitting in her home when a stray bullet passed through her window and entered her skull. Since then, Lebanon's domestic investigation has not been the same. So the investigation and the port explosion has been suspended for the last eight months, since the end of December. And this is because of a series of abusive lawsuits uh, that were submitted by the former ministers who were accused by the lead investigator, Judge Bitar. Um, Currently, the investigation is suspended because the government, and specifically the Minister of Finance, is refusing to assign judges to the General Assembly of the Court of Cassation, which is one of the highest courts in Lebanon, so that the court could actually rule on the lawsuits that have been submitted in relation to the um, investigation. For the investigation to continue, the lawsuits against Bitar have to be settled. But the court that deals with such suits currently has no judges, and there's little prospect of any being appointed in the near future. No judges, no resolution of lawsuits, no investigation, no justice. So the suspension today is directly a result of the failure of the government to actually assign judges to that court, which means that it is the government, specifically the Minister of Finance and the political parties behind him that are sabotaging the investigation. And this falls under the whole strategy that has been used by the senior officials who are suspected in the blast, who have refused to submit to justice and have refused to participate in the investigation and have used different methods in order to sabotage this investigation. They started by claiming that they have immunity from prosecution at the judiciary, uh, which is, of course, a, a false interpretation of the Constitution. And then they filed uh, more than 20 lawsuits, most of them abusive and arbitrary lawsuits, against the judge in order to remove him. And then they moved on to discredit the judge in public opinion by accusing him of being politicized, of being sectarian, and of being discretionary. Um, Although there is very clear evidence that proves that all these suspected senior officials were aware of the presence of the ammonium nitrate in the port for several years, and that they were in a position of executive authority where they could have taken measures in order to prevent the explosion from taking place, but they failed to do so while knowing the risks. So there is evidence against all these suspects, yet they claim that the accusations against them are politicized. What they have done is actually in order to refute the accusations against them, instead of going to defend themselves in justice, they have attacked the judge instead. And this is a strategy that we are seeing a lot in Lebanon, and this is one of the cornerstones of the the regime of legal impunity that has ruled in Lebanon for several decades. At the end of the Lebanese civil war in 1990, an amnesty was declared and those accused of committing crimes walked away, leaving their victims behind. Those warlords who commanded militias and carved Lebanon into warring fiefdoms are the ones now ruling the country. And they are the ones who are supposed to oversee this investigation to achieve justice for the victims of the Beirut port blast. The the way we feel about this is we understand that defying the regime of legal impunity in Lebanon is difficult. We do not expect to find truth and justice in just five days, as initially claimed by our officials. We knew that this was going to be a long way. 
Uh, however, the obstacles that have been put in our place are making us feel that the crime continues. It's, um, it's a feeling that um, not only the crime is continuing, but that the, the additional crimes are being committed against us every day by de denying us the mere uh, fair process of the justice investigation. Prospects for securing justice through the Lebanese legal system have been repeatedly stamped on by those in power. In light of this, those on the front lines of the quest for justice are now looking beyond its borders. Um, so there were three main ways that you could get an international investigation into an event like the Beirut blast. I am Ajzoub from Human Rights Watch again. The first is that the Secretary General of the UN himself can set up a fact-finding mission or a board of inquiry. Unfortunately, this Secretary General has not used the power that he has to do this, and so that was you know, quickly off the table. Not an ideal start. The second pathway is the special rapporteurs. So there are UN human rights experts that can conduct their own investigations into human rights abuses and issue uh, reports. Um, and, you know, for example, in the Khashoggi murder, the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Executions did her own investigation and released a report. So that could have been a second option. But unfortunately, none of the Special Rapporteurs whose mandates were linked to the Beirut blast um, wanted to take this on. Try again. So the third and final option was the Human Rights Council, uh, which is the premier human rights body in the world. And one of the functions of this body is to send in fact-finding missions or commissions of inquiry into places where there are either trends of human rights abuses or where you know, one uh, big event happened that resulted in uh, grave human rights violations. And the, the mechanism for that is a country or a group of countries put forward a resolution at the Human Rights Council establishing this fact-finding body. And then the 47 members of the Human Rights Council vote on um, this resolution. So we've been, over the last couple of years, trying to identify a state or a group of states who are willing to put forward that resolution, establishing a fact-finding body into the Beirut blast. An international investigation through the UN Human Rights Council has been determined to be one of the more realistic options. Sarah Copland, now living in her native Australia, has also taken up the cause. I am working on trying to get the Australian government involved because even though we aren't, Australia is not a current member of the Human Rights Council, non-members can still put forward resolutions at the council. The international community response, at first, it was very understandable. They were kind of taking a wait-and-see approach, and I get that because the international route of investigations and justice is never the first port of call. They are only ever intended to be brought into play when local governments are either unable or unwilling to, to pursue justice. I do think now that two years on, um, anyone who's saying that we still need to wait is just playing politics. Two years is enough for a, to wait for an investigation to be completed. There should be no more excuses. The Lebanese investigation has had a, had a chance. There's been no signs that it's going to restart and it's time for the international community to step in and say enough is enough. There is a consensus among victims groups and among organizations that a fact-finding mission from the Human Rights Council would be beneficial for Lebanon because this would not uh, substitute the national investigation, it would complement it, it would not look into individual criminal responsibilities, but it would look into the Lebanese state failure to protect our right to life and also our right to justice. So we believe such an investigation could be useful because it's complementary to the national one. The international community, however, doesn't seem to be interested in helping secure justice for Lebanon. However, we do not think that there is sufficient international support for such a fact-finding mission. Most notably, it seems that France is not interested in supporting such a resolution at the Human Rights Council. Let's rewind a second. Do you remember what Macron said when he visited Beirut two days after the blast? An independent and transparent investigation is, quote, precisely what is owed to all the victims and their families. Yeah, that didn't happen. Despite the photo ops and strong words, Macron has yet to support an international investigation into the Beirut port blast case, and other countries are following France's lead. So when Macron first came to Lebanon, he did promise uh, the public that he would support an international investigation. But in the two years that have passed, he's since uh, reneged on his promise. 
Um, so France has been unwilling to support such an initiative at the Human Rights Council, and we've received a you know, variety of excuses over the last couple of years from it's not the right time to let's give the domestic investigation a chance to this isn't really a human rights issue. Um, but all this resulting in you know, France not moving forward with this uh, initiative. But what's even more troubling is that other states are reluctant or refusing at the, at the moment to move forward with such a resolution without France's uh, support because of what they call France's special relationship with Lebanon, i.e. its colonial history. With each passing day, the window for justice becomes ever narrower. Still, the blast victims are pushing forward. I don't know if we will ever achieve justice, but I know that if there is any remote possible chance that I will get to see Isaac again, that I need to be able to look at him and say, I did everything possible to try and hold those people accountable. You know, when you when you become a mother, even when you're, or, you know, a father as well, when your child passes away, you don't stop being a parent and they don't stop being your child. And I still feel this compulsion to, to do things for him because I expected to have a lifetime of looking after him and, and doing things for him. And so this is my way that I continue to be able to do do things for Isaac. In some ways I need to do it. And as you said, it's cathartic, but, um, um, you know, it's, it's also exhausting and it takes a, it takes a lot, lot out and it's frustrating and it can be disheartening. There's one final chapter to this story and it brings us right up to date. When the port exploded on August 4th, directly in the firing line, standing on the waterfront, were a number of grain silos. To many, they were a saving grace, absorbing the shockwave and protecting the western part of the city. Severely damaged, but largely still standing, for the past two years they have towered over the blast site. An unofficial gravestone. Well, for sure the silos um, are a very important symbol today for us as a society, but specifically for the victims. They represent this crime, they are the visual uh, representation of what happened, and we think that they have a very important value for our right to memory, for the victim's right to justice, and with the investigation being stalled and being sabotaged, preservation and the protection of the silo takes an additional importance. Also, we should remember that we lost nine lives inside the silos, and their remains are still there. So this is very important for the victims. The government took a different view, and without any consultation, decided that the silos were to be torn down. Their plan stalled following a public outcry. But the government's neglect of the silos soon caused their destruction anyway. And in July of this year, as the city prepared itself to remember the losses of August 4th, a fire broke out at the port. It is widely believed to have been caused by the discarded grain fermenting and igniting. The fire was a horrible reminder of that fateful day in August, and to many served as a burning edifice to government failure and inaction. On August 3, 2022, several silos collapsed. A vast cloud of dust was ejected from the site. The following day, precisely two years on from the blast, as crowds gathered to remember the dead and all that had been lost, more collapsed. The blast that took so much continues to stake its claim on the city. So what's important now for us is that the fire is contained, that it does not spread to the southern part, and that the southern part is preserved and protected because we need the future generations to have that memorial. We want the future generations to remember what happened on 4 August, to have that visual uh, memorial so that uh, they never forget it and so that the crime doesn't happen again. The willful neglect of the silos appear to many to be an attempt to erase the memory of the port blast. And with that forced amnesia comes a hope for the accused that they might yet escape accountability. But for those who have lost so much and who have fought so hard for justice, forgetting is never an option. I don't think he'll ever move on um, from this. I might learn to manage better. But moving on is a difficult concept. And, you know, in some ways, you know, a lot of people have actually asked me, you know, how am I healing? You know, am I healing? What do I need to heal? And I think two years, really, in the, the scheme of things is, is a blink of an eye. It's one of the hardest things for me to wrap my head around is the fact that it's been two years. I just, it's incomprehensible to me, especially since Isaac was only with us for two years and three months, and yet he made you know, such a monumental impact on our lives. And so to think that we are soon approaching the time where he'll be gone longer than he was with us is just um, beyond comprehension. And if anyone thinks you can heal from this and move on within two years, um, I think, you know, they obviously haven't experienced uh, this kind of grief and loss themselves. 
justice won't make things better, but the fact that we still have to put our energy into this fight rather than focusing on processing our feelings and coming to terms with that happened, um, it just extends out that sort of trauma. This episode of The New Arab Voice was written by me, Will Christou, and Hugo Goodrich. It was produced by Hugo Goodrich. A special thanks to all those who trusted us with their stories. Our theme music was by Omar Al-Fil. The New Arab Voice will be back next week. Until then, you can find all of our previous episodes on all major podcast platforms. You can also check out our Instagram page and Twitter account, both at The New Arab Voice, for additional content. You can subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode, and you can also rate and review, which helps us spread the word. Don't forget to follow The New Arab on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all the latest news from the region.